Listen, I have a story for you. Something the examiner will love. A healing, possibly divine. A girl performing miracles after a visitation from the Virgin Mary. Chicago, New York, DC, every demographic on this planet is eating this up. Give me the exclusive. All right, I think I got this all set up. What do you say we do a couple real easy questions? How many are gonna watch? Mary wants to reach as many people as possible. Maybe millions. There are people out there that don't believe in your miracles. How would you respond to those folks? Seeing is believing. And why do you think Mary chose you? I opened myself up and welcomed her in. Witnesses of the Virgin Mary draw millions of faithful each year. The Vatican's been tasked to investigate this visitation from the Blessed Virgin. I have read several libraries worth on the supernatural. <laughs> Investigated half a dozen miracles. Prove them all false. She's here. You think there could be other forces at play here? When God builds a church, the devil builds a chapel next door. Don't doubt her. Doubt weakens faith. Hail Mary, full of grace. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. This is not the work of the Virgin Mary. It's the work of the unholy. Faith in evil empowers evil. Believe in her. Offer your soul to Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God. The Lord is with you. Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host, Viz, and it is my honor and pleasure tonight to welcome our very special guest, writer, director, and producer of The Unholy, Evan Spiliotopoulos. Evan, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I saw The Unholy yesterday, and first off, congratulations on an amazing job. Um, this is definitely going to be by the end of the year it's at least going to be one of the top five best horror movies of 2021 i can say that without any doubt so let's just go ahead and get started the unholy is way different from your other credentials you have a very long uh distinguished career especially in writing what made you take this dive into the horror realm I am primarily a horror fan, actually. My involvement with Disney animation and family movies uh, just happened uh, as fate. That's what got me into the film industry. But uh, I grew up a huge horror fan, and I grew up a rabid James Herbert fan. He's, of course, the late, great UK novelist who wrote the book Shrine, on uh, which our movie is based. And uh, it just, uh, you know, now that I finally got to the point in my career where I could take that extra step, I, this was the project I wanted to direct. That is awesome. Now, uh, what was it like going, this was also your directorial debut. I want our viewers to know that. So what was it like going uh, from the writer's room into the trenches behind the camera? Uh, absolutely terrifying, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, I have had the good fortune to be invited on the set of uh, most of the films, the live action films that I've written. And I've seen what the director goes through and I really had absolutely no ambition to do that. I like just writing the script, sending it off into the universe and vaya con Dios and hopefully they'll do a good job. Um, and what happened with this one was I uh, had been carrying the book around uh, since I was 13 when I first read it. And when I entered the business, uh, any studio that liked me, I would bother them and bug them and say, hey, will you adopt this for me? Will you buy the rights? And finally, Sony Screen Gems agreed. And then they hit me with a curveball and said, 
well, we want you to direct it because you know you you you're you're there, you're at that place in your career where you should do it. And my team said yes for me. And then they said, hey, this will be great, buddy. You should really do it. It'll it'll branch out a whole new avenue. And uh, I figured, you know what? I'll do. I'll say yes, especially when they paired me with Sam Raimi because I figured, okay. Sam is a movie god. He's a horror movie genius, and yeah. he's going to look at me, and he did. But I also figured that Sam's going to be the first person to say, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Uh, let's bring an adult. And they never did, and here I am. <laughs> you did a great job. I, would have, I, I was totally surprised when I was researching for tonight to see this was your directorial debut. I mean, I was like, wow, not bad. Not bad at all. Great job. Now, uh so you, this project has been in your mind, you said, since you were 13 years old, right? So through all the years, you must have come up through many different variations on how you th thought the screenplay should go, right? Nope. This was it. This was it, really. And uh, you wrote it and you got to direct it. I mean, you had total control from the writing to getting your vision onto the screen. When you saw yeah. the end product, were you like, yes, I got it exactly the way I wanted it? Uh, I am extremely proud and happy about the product. I'm thrilled with the performances. And I, I really, this is something that I really want to underline that the actors in this film have done such a great job. They make me look great. But I will also say, now that I've seen the final version, there's like a trillion things I wish I could have done better. <laughs> uh, I think it's impossible for us maybe to be satisfied with our work, but uh, uh, you know, I, I just think, I, I just want to um, stay with the acting for a second because as you've seen with the film, it's um, almost a throwback to 70s horror mm -hmm. cinema, with more character based, more plot based. And specifically it like tips the hat to Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and The Omen. And uh, these are films that are distinguished by performances. I mean, The Exorcist, you know, got three uh, Oscar nominations yes. for his cat. Uh, and Rosemary's Baby won the Oscar for Ruth Gordon. Um, I mean, I'm not going there with ours, but what I'm very proud of is we put together a great supporting cast surrounded by our leading man, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and they delivered 100%, and they carry you through the scares of this film beautifully. Now, uh, what was it like working with J.D. Morgan? He is, of course, this bigger-than-life personality, full of charisma. Uh, I mean, did you write the character knowing you wanted him to play it? Yes, and there is a reason for this. Um, I bought Jeffrey Dean Morgan's house 10 years ago. I'm now in a new place, but at the two years ago when he signed on to do it, I was still at the house that I bought from him. And so when we had our first call, and he's in New York, we were doing a Skype call just like us, I basically said, hey, look at the living room that I'm in. Do you recognize it? And he fell out of his chair. And he's like, you're in my home in Studio City. And I, I feel like I had this relationship with him because uh, his energy was everywhere in that place. And so when I was writing it was writing The Unholy, I saw him very specifically as Jerry Fenn. There's another reason for that, by the way. One of the references, you know how when we make a movie, we always relate to maybe some other plot line in some other genre. Yeah. Uh, Billy Wilder directed a 1952 film called Ace in the Hole, which is about a morally corrupt journalist who uh, discovers that in the aftermath of a cave-in, there are victims still alive and trapped, and he doesn't reveal it because he wants to milk the story for as long as possible. Mm. So the, the unholy is kind of the horror cousin to Ace in the Hole, and the way Billy Wilder got an audience to stay with this bastard character for so long is he cast Kirk Douglas who's fun and sexy and a leading man and you just love him. And I needed a character actor for The Unholy who, Finn is not that bad, but he's morally corrupt yes. in a big way. Yes. I needed someone charming who can carry an audience along and want this guy to be redeemed. And JDM has kind of put a signature on these characters, yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, he can murders people and he's everybody's favorite character. Exactly. It's like, it's like, uh, People are still upset to this day that the the Walking Dead lost those favorite characters, but they've forgiven the guy who did it, <laughs> and he's one of the top favorites. And I thought yeah. the casting of J.D. Morgan was perfectly just like you described it, because he is a morally corrupt character in the movie, and you don't want us. The movie would have gone a completely different way if somebody else was brought in who could not 
the audience could not relate to as well as they did with JDM, and then they would start off hating the character. And then yeah. as you see him starting to turn a little bit and more and more, the audience would not be able to follow along. So the casting of Morgan was completely spot on. When was uh, the idea come about for the movie to be released around Easter? Uh, that is a marketing decision, basically. That is a studio. You know, in filmmakers, once we deliver the film, it's like you've given your child off um, for adoption because we have very little control once you deliver the contractual cut. And the studio decided to release it uh, on, on, we must point out, Catholic Easter yes. because you and I, I believe, are Greek Orthodox. Yeah, our that's Easter next week. <laughs> that's a week apart. It's always been that way. And, uh, it's a month, it's a month apart. To, is it a month apart this year? Yeah. Oh, Our Jesus. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, the Catholics and the, and the Orthodox, they're so similar. They just can't agree on the calendar. <laughs> it, the calendar and the fact that uh, Catholics have the wafer and we have the bread. It's, exactly. I mean, exactly. Bread. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. <you're, laughs> now, uh, that tree, okay? The tree, the, the famous tree. We're not going to give away spoilers of the movie, but that tree in the movie. Was that a prop? Was that an actual tree? Uh, what was that? And we built it for the movie. Oh, man. I uh, we, we hired a wonderful production designer uh, named Felicity Abbott, who did um, Upgrade, which is a great film of the last couple of years, Lee Wanell. And um, she, we, I described it to her like I wanted it to look like a female figure whose arms are reaching towards heaven. And so there is the, the, the arms you can definitely see in the branches. There is a a curve to the trunk of the tree that conveys conveys its femininity. But yeah, that thing's artificial and we scared the hell out of the locals in the town where we shot because it just popped up overnight and it looks real. Where was it shot, by the way? Sudbury, Massachusetts. Oh, a so one welcoming, great place. Oh, so you guys did actually go to Massachusetts to film it. I love when that's done. Now, uh, what was your, what would you say was the most important thing that you did not want lost on the audience in your adaptation of this screenplay and the direction of the film? What was the, the one thing that you definitely did not want the audience to miss? Uh, the awe of the first 30 minutes. Mm. So basically, the narrative is different from most horror movies. Um, and it's it brings you in through a series of potential miracles. And what I wanted, I, I described it to my team as the song of Bernadette gone wrong. Uh, the song of Bernadette is a classic 1944 film of the miracles in Lourdes, one Jennifer Jones and Oscar. And um, it's it, it, what we wanted to do was recreate that sense of mystery and awe and emotion that you might experience if witnessing a natural miracle. Yeah. But with this hint of, oh, not everything is not just quite right. Uh, and that's what I wanted to really get for the first 30 minutes. I remember I was like I told you I saw it yesterday. I took a break like 30 minutes in to go make myself some coffee. I, my son was on the second floor, and I telling him you're missing a good movie. This is a character based horror movie. You know you would love it because he's really into those psychological horror films, and that was great. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a place for gore and blood, like in an airy horror fan. Yeah, you enjoy watching that, but uh, to me. What's actually scary is the human aspect of it, the psychology part of it. And I love the one part like, that I loved the most was when Alice spoke. It didn't take another 30 minutes for everybody else to believe Fen because she did yeah. it in the couple of scenes yeah. later. And everybody knew that something was going on. Now, yeah. um, what was the heart? Now, how much diving did you do, if any, into Catholicism? Oh, heavily. We had a Catholic consultant, actually, on the set. Uh, James Herbert uh, was raised Catholic, so a lot of the material in the, in the script is from the book. And the, the real big part, which I just loved, uh, was the process that the Catholic Church undergoes mm -hmm. in determining something is a miracle or not. And that the, the fact that they actually sent a priest, uh, the Inquisitor, whose nickname is the Devil's Advocate, because this priest's job is to use modern science, medicine, and technology to disprove yep. a reported miracle. Mm -hmm. And if he fails, it's a miracle. 
And so this this counterintuitive approach is really something that I respected and and we we dramatize in the movie. Um, and uh, it's that's true. That's all true. Now Carrie uh, Carrie Elwes's character, who I love yes. Carrie Elwes, uh, he played it so well. And I'm sure I want to ask you if this was part of the plan. About three quarters into the movie, I start thinking that he's actually a part of this cult maybe working for the the demon or not a demon the bad spirit you know whatever you want to call it let's you know leave it at that is, is that how you wanted to come across like we don't know if this guy is really just naive or he's playing the other side i uh, the, the conversations we had with carrie was that he is the mayor of amity the town from jaws yes so He's not, to be fair, he's not part of the bad. Yeah. He's not involved in that. But he's the guy going, it's 4th of July and the beach has got to be open. You know, he's seen dollar signs. So that's his problem. Exactly. He uh, becomes tunnel vision like this is great for the church. This is going to exactly. be great. And it wasn't until the end that he actually sees the truth. Now, what was your expectation for the film when you were writing the screwing play and, you know, compared to the finished product, we sort of went over this already. But if there's one aspect that you could change, you said you saw a, tr a trillion things you would have done differently. Give me one thing that you would have done a little differently without revealing any spoilers. Well, I, this is a, a consequence of the pandemic. Um, there, once we, we shot the movie in two parts. We started shooting in mid-February, and then we had to stop four weeks in on our seven-week shoot wow. because the pandemic hit. So we went into lockdown. We came back to L.A. We scattered into the four winds. Diogo Morgado, our wonderful Portuguese actor, plays Monsignor Delgard mm -hmm. in Lisbon. So we're scattered now, and I have the opportunity, which is super rare, of taking the summer and doing an assembly of the footage we already shot. Wow. And that actually got the film finished because it, it, our, our budget is still not huge. So it was very easy for Sony to take a tax write off on it. But they really liked what we had gotten. So they wanted us to go back. Now, the problem with that is when we returned in September to Massachusetts, when the Massachusetts CDC allowed us to resume work, we obviously had to follow strict, um, uh, strict rules to complete safely and with everybody being healthy. And one of that was we couldn't have more than 10 extras indoors at the same time. And even when we did, they had to be six feet apart. So there is a funeral scene yeah. in the movie. And I will reveal this. If you pause it when it comes out in streaming or if you buy it on Blu-ray, which I hope you do, if you pause it, you will notice that that church is filled with the same 10 actors over and over and over and over. Because what we did was we had we shot them changed their clothes, moved them aside, shot them, changed their clothes, moved them aside, shot them. And that's something that in the best of circumstances I wouldn't do. Now, I got to ask you, is that a trick that you came up with or that, is that has been used you know, for a while now? No, it is. I mean, the idea of, um, of uh, tiling extras, that's the term, is something that absolutely exists. But using it under these circumstances, usually to increase your budget, if you just can't afford uh, a church load of people, you do it that way. In our case, it was the only way to complete the film. Uh, I'll tell you another little secret. Uh, there are scenes in this film where Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Diogo Morgado, and Carrie Always are in the same room in the movie, and they're not in the same room when we shot it, because in the second half of production, Carrie and Diogo could not return. Diogo was uh, stuck in uh, Portugal, and Carrie was here in LA. So what we had to do was hire stand-ins for a lighting reference opposite Jeffrey Dean Morgan, remove them and have them shoot the scene in empty air, then do a green screen shoot in Portugal and another green screen shoot in LA, lift Carrie and Diogo and drop them into their respective scenes with Jeffrey Dean in the final cut. It looks great. Oh my God, I would say so. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, but it was, believe me, I would never do another movie like this again <laughs> under these circumstances. You you guys really had to get really creative. Uh, yeah, I would never would have guessed that. Now it's coming out this Friday. Is it uh, coming out to both theaters and video on demand, or just theaters? Uh, what's the release going to be like? It's exclusively theaters. Uh, of course, there will be streaming options further down the line in the future. But right now, this is a, a theatrical release. Uh, we're going to be rolling it out worldwide. Um, it is United. It's Spain uh, today, 
United States on Friday and then on and on and on throughout the spring until we reach the United Kingdom on June 11th. Is that, is it, was that purely Sony's decision? Oh, purely, yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I imagine part of it is different countries have different lockdowns right now. Yeah. And we are basically trying to, in, in terms of the United States, we were fortunate enough that now theaters are actually, with not full capacity, of course, yeah. but most around the country are open. Um, the United Kingdom is still in lockdown and France is still in lockdown. And so we're rolling out, staying close to when we think slash hope theaters will be open worldwide. Wow. Wow. I thought I, will, I could have almost bet that almost all studios are doing that simultaneous theaters and video on demand. So, but the movie should pack them in because right now I've had many guests on this show and I asked them, you know, before the pandemic, we would watch commercials and they'd be full of trailers, upcoming movies coming to theaters and so and so. Those have sort of gone to the wayside since the pandemic hit. And I had a guest, Barbara Crampton, on and I asked Barbara, how do you, uh, how are they marketing these films? And her answer to me was word of mouth. Word of mouth is the best way. Hitting social media like you're doing today uh, is is becoming the way to market these films. Now, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan's Finn character plays a corrupt journalist. When you were writing the screenplay, did you use any kind of reference to the fake news that's going on in real life today to draw Absolutely. inspiration on that character? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things. His character is based on Stephen Glass, mm. uh, a journalist who, of course, was ca caught uh, making up stories and the subject of the wonderful film Shattered Glass. Yeah. Uh, but what made our film extremely topical was that the term fake news has entered the zeitgeist. And without wanting to get pretentious, the movie can be seen as a metaphor of what happens to a community when a journalist loses their moral compass and starts uh, disseminating news that just serves an agenda and is completely manufactured. And of course, in our case, it is uh, evil spreads around, but mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it, it, it rots the community. And that's part of the message we want to get across. Now, we know in the beginning, uh, Finn's character, all he cares about is getting a story, getting a paycheck. Uh, with At which point in the movie do you feel his redemption arc is ongoing throughout the whole film? Okay, right. we could call it that. But when do you think he's like, all right, you know what? Screw the job. People's souls, forget their lives too. Their souls are in danger. At which point, like if you would give like first half, middle or very end, would you say he went through that complete transformation to being a good person and not as morally corrupt? Uh, you have to plan when you're writing a screenplay, you have to plant the, the beats in the character arc. So there are several key moments. Now there's one critical one, which I'll get to, but the key moments are when the boy walks, yeah. he goes, now he's believing his own eyes. And even though his eye is still in the dollar signs, he has no reason to believe he has discovered anything other than a genuine miracle. So he's thrilled. Everything's awesome for him. In the middle of the movie, he gets what, what we call the false victory, where he gets his job back. In fact, with a promotion, mm -hmm. the world is knocking at his door and he thinks he's got it all back. And that's false because of the stuff that's going to follow later. Um, about the middle of Act Two, you have literally, without revealing anything, a body drops in his lap. And at that point, he goes, ooh, all is not well. And then there's a scene in the film where there's a phone call and somebody accuses him of uh, being capable of selling his soul for a story. And he says, I think I already did. Mm -hmm. At that moment, that is his moment of now I'm no longer the fan of the past. Now I have to take responsibility for my actions and step up. Now, having both of us watched the movie already, uh, having that luxury, would you say that in the beginning of the movie, Jerry Finn in his character is still reluctant to see that what he did as a journalist was completely wrong and he actually thinks he's just being accused unfairly and being treated unfairly? Or do you think it's actually hit him that what he did uh, as a journalist was really wrong and he's just paying the price for his actions? Oh, I think he knew he was doing wrong when he was doing it and just didn't care. Okay. It's actually option three, it's option C. Uh, he knew what he was doing wrong all along and just didn't care because it was benefiting him. And the fact that he got caught is just frustrating. It's not, he's not guilty. 
uh, he doesn't feel guilty. And it's not until he sees the actual physical damage that his lies are doing in the story of the film that he actually starts realizing that his lies hurt people, yeah. kill people, and that he is endangered more than just himself. He's endangered the community and, frankly, the world. Exactly. If I was to pick one scene where his ego is like at peak, is that scene in the motel when he looks in the mirror and he says, who's back? I'm back. Yeah. That was like Negan, a little bit of Negan, a little bit of Finn, but totally yes. J.D. Morgan and all his charisma right there. Uh, that that was my scene where I'm like, okay, this guy is at his peak. And there's a great scene when he's having dinner and uh, I forget the actress's name. What's her name? Katie Hassel. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. They were having dinner and she asks him, why did you do it? And I think he explained it really well, not as in a fictional sense, but in a real sense as well. When you're so high and you're being adored by so many people, he says it's like a drug. It's intoxicating. And I loved that scene. Uh, were you putting that in so people can understand, like from a real reference, that if you don't keep yourself grounded... Fame, fortune, it's not what really matters in life, but you can get swept away from it and lose your way. Oh, for sure. I mean, we have, you know, that quote from the Bible at the end of the film about false idols. Mm -hmm. uh, fame and uh, fortune and pride and those things are false idols. I and mean, that's what uh, has corrupted Finn. It's the desire for these earthly goods that um, have changed him from what probably was at the very beginning of his career, a very legitimate, very talented and very hard hitting journalist. And they just turned him into this uh, matinee idol. Uh, you know, I mean, in the film business, we obviously see that we have uh, we have filmmakers uh, of, on all parts of the industry who are at the peak of their powers and would do anything to sustain it. And that's Kind of a caution tale for our industry as well. It, it is. It is absolutely the truth. How much say besides J.D. Morgan did uh, they give you in the, the casting of the other roles? Absolutely full control. I couldn't believe it. Wow. I could not believe it. I mean, you know, when, when you're casting on a $160 million movie, you absolutely need a celebrity. You need a face that people will recognize. When you're casting a what became, I have to say, a six, sixteen million dollar movie, we were twelve, and because of COVID, the studio invested more money in order for us to be able to complete the film. But you're able to go with the best actors uh, in the auditions. Now, Jeffrey Dean was an offer straight away because I wrote the part for him. We wanted him, and he he fit the bill for the role. But uh, all other characters, uh, except for Carrie, who was a meeting, were auditions. And uh, that's how we found Cricket Brown. And this is her first film, The Girl Who Plays Alice. Alice yeah. she's, she was amazing. She's amazing. And we take great pride in introducing her to the world because she has never worked in film or TV before. She's done a few shorts mm -hmm. and an off play. And I think she's going to be great. Um, Katie, who you just mentioned, if she ever watches, this is going to murder me because when she walked into the audition, I didn't know who she was. And uh, she's got a list of 100 movies and TV shows. Yeah. Um, and she sat down and she went, uh, my dad's a small town doctor in Maine. I'm a New England girl. I know Natalie Gates inside out. And then she auditioned and she was the character. Um, Bill Sadler, who is one of my favorite actors, still had to audition. And, uh, you know, Father Hagen, his character, is suffering from emphysema. And in the audition, he started coughing. And I wanted to get him a glass of water. It was so convincing. Um, and well, he was we, faking it. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, it, the man's an actor. I mean, he's fine. He's he's, I remember him all the way back from Die Hard 2. Absolutely. He's the bad guy in Die Hard 2. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he's he's an actor's actor. He's one of the warmest human beings I've ever met. I mean, he's wonderful. And everybody, uh, Christine Adams, um, who's from uh, Black, uh, uh, Black Lightning, yeah. uh, she uh, is playing Slade. And she's a British actress. And she first auditioned as an American and I was like, Wait, can I hear it with your actual accent? And we decided, no, Christine, keep keep the English accent. It brings another element to the show. <laughs> that is such a great story. Now, being a first-time director, what was the biggest thing that surprised you that you were totally not expecting in directing? See, I, because I had the pleasure and uh, privilege of being invited on set for films, I had seen, I know how a movie gets made, so nothing really surprised me. What I learned, however, was just the importance of uh, pre-production. 
uh, for any filmmaker out there, any student filmmaker, any aspiring filmmaker, your time is before the camera started rolling the first day of production. Uh, rehearse the actors, but rehearse the camera moves. Like grab your director photography, go to the location, or if you don't have it yet, go to the production offices and rehearse with the video camera the moves and the blocking that you're hoping to do. So everybody's familiar, the camera crew's familiar, the actors are familiar before you even start shooting. Because for a tight schedule, it just makes things move a hell of a lot faster. That, that makes perfect sense. Now that you've got your directorial debut under your belt, uh, of course, you have brilliant writing credentials, and now you're officially stepped your foot into horror. Do you want to continue? Would you say if you had a choice, or let's say you, you had to pick writing horror or being a director, which way would, which direction would you choose? I'm always going to be a writer primarily because that's my first love and that's my strength, frankly, as a filmmaker. Um, but I do want to continue directing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I will say that um, a lot of times in, in the business, when you've got a movie coming out, you book your next job based on the buzz of the film coming out. Yeah. And I very specifically, I wanted to avoid doing that because I want whoever, if anyone ever hires me in the future to be doing it because they've seen my film and liked it um, so that we can start off in an honest uh, position. But um, uh, it may be horror again. I don't know. I don't actually have anything lined up, of course. But it may be horror again. Uh, I have loads of scripts all over town set up that maybe I'll go back and say, hey, now I can direct. Can you let me do this thing, Paramount, please? <laughs> so, who knows? Uh, but, I mean, do you, you, you kind of sound like, you know, whichever way, do you have a preference to like, you know, I really like this, the horror thing. I want to pursue that or go down that avenue. I mean, of course you would take, if they offer you the right deal, the right script, the right, you know, whatever, you will take it. But is horror something that you really, really want to pursue moving ahead in your career? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I love the genre and I'm, I'm very proud of the movie I made here. So absolutely. I, I you, you notice based on my writing career that I work in a lot of different genres. Like I've done fairy tales, I've done musicals, uh, I've done action adventure, now Snake Eyes, you know, the G.I. Joe mm -hmm. movie, which is a martial arts movie, which I never thought I'd get the chance to write, and I did. So I, I'm, I'm of the filmmaking persuasion of we love movies, and I love doing many different movies. So maybe the next one is another horror movie. I certainly would love that. Maybe it's a period piece and a, and a small drama. I'm, maybe. Well, one thing we know for sure is you're very versatile. If you look back on your entire writing career, is there a particular work that you're most proud of? Yes, you're going to, you're going to laugh at me, but it's Pooh's Heffelmuck movie. <laughs> I just love it. It's a sweet <laughs> film that hit all its marks. I mean, guys, you got to know the I mean the credits this man has. I mean, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, uh, The Little Mermaid, Ariel, and on and on and on. That was fun. I was not expecting that answer. I was absolutely not expecting that answer. Uh, now, considering the state of the world, is there any, uh, besides the fake news, any other social commentary in the movie that is sort of, subtle that people might miss oh I, I, unfortunately i think it's not subtle but it's beware of false, false idols i mean we we state it pretty clearly and that doesn't just apply to you know the media it applies to anything we do in our lives i mean it's it's beware of characters who show up and tell you that they have a magic wand that'll solve all your problems what solves problems is hard work and education and helping each other and uh, that's kind of the message of the film I have not had yet the privilege to read the book, so I'm going to just ask you this question. In your opinion, how faithful did you stay to the original novel in your screenplay? Uh, it, well, the original novel is 450 pages and the script is 105. So it's a classic uh, example of an adaptation where you have to streamline mm -hmm. everything. Um, I'll give you an example. The, the town of Banfield is a protagonist in the book Shrine. And a lot of the townsfolks and the mayor and uh, there's a there's an American journalist female who comes in and competes with Fen for the story. So one of the decisions that you always have to make as a writer now is who's your protagonist? Yeah. It's Jerry Fenn. The entire story is told through Jerry Fenn's point of view. So I had to, as much as I loved many, many scenes, a book is one of my favorites of all time. But that's why I carried it around with me. Yeah. I had 
construct a skeleton that uh, uh, served Jerry Finn's character arc and everything else had to serve that character arc. So um, that's what, how I ended up with 105 pages instead of 450. I got to tell you a story, though, because it's something that every single one of us who's worked on the movie is super proud. So James Herbert, the novelist, the author, has passed away. And his family, his four daughters, uh, now are his estate. And we screened the movie for them last week. And they sent us a letter basically saying, uh, we feel unanimously that this is the best film adaptation of our father's work ever. Wow. And particularly love the acting. Uh, and I sent it to Jeffrey, and then I sent it to everybody, all the cast and crew. And it's just one of those things where you're like, that is such an honor to read that from the, these people the who family. are the goal of this man's legacy. That wow that that must have been really heartfelt that that must have really made you feel great now uh the antagonist in the movie let's call it the antagonist seemed to gain strength uh from the followers that worshipped it uh yep. is that a metaphor also as well to uh or social commentary in reference to social media uh, again going back to false idols people following false idols that really seems to be the the biggest theme here. And I would also say what is uh, a theme that's mentioned in a way that it's not actually brought up is God giving us free will. Saying if you're choosing and to follow with your faith uh, an evil entity, then I'm just going to let you do it and choose your own path. And if you and if you sell your soul to the devil because you put your faith in the wrong place, I will let that happen. How do you feel about that? Well, I think you're absolutely on the money. I mean, I think when you look at the classic Faustian bargain, when you look at the original text of Faust, how does anyone sell their soul to the devil if they're not if they don't have free will? Exactly. And, um, it, you know, all our flaws are, you know, a, it, they're all choices. I mean, they're choices we make. And Fenn definitely chose to go down the wrong path. That's why I said earlier, this is a guy who didn't think he was doing good when he was making stories up. He, he knew what he was doing. He just didn't care. Exactly. And that's a complete choice. Now, when uh, Jerry gets assigned the story to go to check out the mutilated cow, now, it's not really referenced, but in your opinion, and this can be totally your opinion, you think that was the spirit of Mary calling him uh, to the town because, you know, she knew that he was the best, most corrupt person to help spread her word? Or do you, would you say it was God himself that was testing him? This is totally your opinion. Sure. And actually, I, see, I say neither. Uh, Mary certainly not because she is contained. At the when the outset of the film, That's she's right. trapped. So she doesn't actually have influence on him until she sees him in that field and he sees into his soul and goes, "Oh boy, this is a kindred spirit. I can work with this guy." And uh, I don't think uh, I don't think God is you know keeping his microscope on Jerry Fenn. No. I think no. it's all Jerry all along. Absolutely. I, I yeah yeah. I didn't see any of the events of him getting there being a part of any divine plan once he got yep. there though that completely changed he's on the he's on the chessboard once he gets there absolutely yeah he's he's open to uh anything that throws his way they know he is corrupt you know they know he's corruptible and uh whatnot now when it comes to uh jd morgan and on the set is he like a real hoot to work with does he like crack jokes all the time yes. is he a prankster on the set what's he like oh I, I, he he cracks jokes all the time um and the joy of it was yeah he and katie asselton have known each other for going on 20 years now wow. so it was crazy watching them because they would be preparing for a scene and they'd be talking about hey remember bob who we met 16 years ago oh, yeah bob's great here i'm going action <laughs> they do their scene cut oh yeah bob we should go have dinner with bob someday i mean it was insane uh, and but it brought this chemistry that these people had from their own life onto the film, which is awesome. But Jeffrey, uh, one thing I, I got to say is like when you're any kind of director, not just a first time director, your leads are more than your cast. They're your partners. And so you have to be on the same page creatively with them from the get go. Uh -huh. And at that, your allies against the world. And Jeffrey's one of those guys. 
Uh, we have a mutual friend, a great producer, Bo Flynn, who did Hercules with me, but he's done Rampage with Jeffrey Dean, Red Dawn with Jeffrey Dean. Um, oh, he's worked with Je two other movies at least, and he just rehires Jeffrey Dean Morgan over and over again because he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. they, we love Jeffrey Dean. He's a great actor. Absolutely. He can do almost any part. Uh, the very last scene is the one that we've seen before in a film that insinuates other powers might be a play. Did you purposely do it that way in case an offer of a sequel may come? Let me well, let, let me rephrase that. Would you want to do a sequel to this movie? Do you think it should have a sequel or be just left alone? I, I'm a big fan of left alone things, um, but I will say that the successful sequels are ones that follow a character that hasn't quite reached its full potential yet. Mm -hmm. And I think there's more to be done with Alice. I think Alice is a great character and I'd like to see her story continue. When we meet her, I, I'm not gonna give any spoilers, but she does come to peace with herself. And I think there's things we can do there and make her uh, an inspirational character in the sequel. Um, but no, the reason I put that scene actually at the end is just as a caution. I, I really feel that this movie has ended the way we think it's ended, mm -hmm. but I put that little little sting at the end just to keep us on our toes. That's it. That's all. That I didn't think could happen. Which character do you personally character do you relate to the most? Is it Finn, Alice, uh, Hagen, the Hags? Hey, Hagen. Hagen. Yeah. 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 Yep. He's ornery and crusty and he's got a heart of gold. Not that I'm ornery or crusty, but I like him because he he's the moral voice of the whole movie. And he's kind of the guy who's like I really think from the get-go, things aren't quite right here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even when everyone is seeing the miracle of Alice and what now she can do that she couldn't do before, even though he's the preacher, this is this is his congregation that is seeing a miracle supposedly happen right in front of their eyes. What leads him, being a Catholic priest, to be a little bit, hey, you know what? This ain't supposed to happen. Yeah. Why instinct. is it happening? Instinct. I think he's got a nose for these things. And I think he's, he, you know, we, Bill acts it to the hilt in the miracles that we see where he's, he's crying when that boy walks. But there's something about it that's just like, just bugs him, just gets under his skin. And I ascribe it to instinct. He has no reason whatsoever to be uh, thinking that it's anything but wonderful except instinct. Which is something that Carrie Elvis's character did not have. He was a char his character absolutely is a politician more than he is a priest. So it, the joke about him was we we wanted Carrie because he looks like a matinee idol, and we wanted uh, Bishop James Giles to be this photogenic, media savvy bishop. I told Carrie, by the way, that if dark if the dark entity did not exist in this movie, he would be the hero of the movie oh, yeah. because not wrong about anything that he says. Mm -hmm. He really, I think he just really, truly wanted to believe it, and it, it made him see only what he wanted to see. Absolutely. That's exactly correct. Now, did you take any steps to ensure that there was an accurate and fair representation for communities with disabilities? Like you said, we saw the, 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 the little boy who was in a wheelchair. Did you okay. take uh, any kind of special steps to make sure everything was portrayed properly with respect to people with disabilities in mind? Absolutely. We actually had a medical advisor to to tell us what the two disabilities that we portray in the film, Alice's and the little boy, Toby's, were and what would be the absolute realistic way of portraying them. Now, of course, in Alice's case, she gets healed very early in the movie. Uh, otherwise, like the great A Quiet Place, we would have cast an actor, an actress who cannot uh, hear yeah. or speak. But she does right away, and then she becomes this uh, orator who leads congregations in prayer. And so we, we definitely needed uh, someone like Cricket. Uh, but yeah, we had uh, the medical pr procedure of what their afflictions, what their um, uh, illnesses are, in the case of Alice's an illness, um, was realistically portrayed with the help of our medical advisor. Oh, okay. That makes perfect sense. Now, uh, Alice's character... I mean, you can never tell that this 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 young woman is just full of talent. How did she take? How do you? Let me find the right way to phrase this. How did she take 
being directed by you? Was she very, you know, you know getting it right away? Uh, you know, she knew exactly what your vision was for a particular scene and she got it on the first or two takes or being fairly a newcomer, it took her a little while to get used to the groove of things. She got it right away. Um, I actually thought that Alice was going to be the hardest part to cast because it's so challenging and because we knew we wanted a, a young actor. We, we wanted somebody in her late teens. And uh, it turned out to be the easiest part because there is an abundance of talent out there. And we auditioned 200, 300 actresses, and there were nine that I think could have definitely done the part. And Cricket was just the best of those nine. And the reason she was is because not only was her performance right on the money in the audition, she looks, she's lovely, but she looks like this small town girl. She doesn't have that yeah. Yeah. glamour unless you impose it on her, which you could. Uh, and the third reason is she's got an aura of spirituality about her. Like she's a very, very old soul, you might say. Mm -hmm. She's got those, at, at her young age, she's got those philosophical conversations with herself that um, enhanced her performance. Now, because she came out of the theater and she was a drama student, she's used to working with directors. So it wasn't somebody who decided, no matter how talented they might be, who decided, hey, today I'm going to be an actor and got the part. This is somebody who actually studied acting, studied drama. And so I had her watch a whole bunch of movies uh, as reference, like the song of Bernadette, uh, like the miracle worker, like um, uh, uh, children of a lesser God, yeah. uh, the quiet place. Uh, and um, it, just as just the physical preparation, not the actual medical stuff. We then put her in touch with a, um, uh, a doctor who actually taught sign language. She learned sign language that way. Uh, then uh, when we got on set, it was basically just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And she she's really instinctive and really has a process from her drama school that allowed her to do the part within a couple of takes at the most. Was there any kind of uh, push from the studio to get a more known actress to play the role? Or... None whatsoever. Okay. None whatsoever. They, th that's the thing that was great. It's like an unbelievable is that they never pushed me. Once we had Jeffrey, because he got the movie made, they never pushed me to cast anybody that I didn't want to cast. Um, and so every actor you see in this film, down to the down to the extras, but down to the one line roles, are people who just came in, gave a great audition, and we cast them. Like um, there's a teenage girl who plays the teenage fan, whose whose faith is destroyed uh, by Alice by the end of the film. Yes. And there's the parents of Toby, and there's uh, this waitress who has three lines, and they're all wonderful local actors, and they just came in and auditioned and did a great job. That's awesome. Tell us about Sam Raimi, okay? Did you yeah. know Sam before this? Uh, so you just met, yeah. you met for this project. What's so he like? I, have, I mean, you, like you said, he's a legend. He he is the most approachable, down-to-earth human being you're ever going to meet in the film industry. So uh, the, the way it happened was when the studio decided they wanted me to direct it in their insanity, they wanted to pair me off with somebody experienced as a producer. And Sam, of course, has a company called Ghost House, so he produces a lot of supernatural thrillers. He did Don't Breathe, the Evil Dead remakes, mm -hmm. um, and um, the, he's in variety like every week with a new project being set up. And so they paired me off with him, and Sam knows cinema, overall cinema, not just supernatural horror, like no other. The man's a film buff from childbirth. And um, he's a kid from Michigan. He's just this like down to earth guy who just comes in is like, let's make a movie. I love making movies. And he was intrinsically involved in the entire aspects of script development and then pre-production. He was with us for the first two weeks of filming and then he left to direct Doctor Strange 2. And then from London, when I was in LA, he was involved in the post-production period and the editing, the visual effects and all that. And uh, where he was absolutely invalu invaluable is in the technical aspects of things, because I st I've made a movie now. I still don't know two thirds of the technical aspects. Um, he guided me through the practical makeup and the VFX and the design of the characters, the, the supernatural characters. And um, he just basically walked me through the actual physical process of making a movie. Because, again, I'd like to say I know the script. I know how to tell a story. And I feel that I know how to cast. Um, and I didn't know anything else beyond, beyond that. Now, you're also a producer in this movie. So yes. did you stay with the film? I'm assuming you did after filming wrapped straight through the editing uh, process. Well, the director would anyway. Okay. Um, but, but yes, uh, in my, my capacity as producer was served mostly by I found the book. 
Um, and then I basically had car conversations with myself, apparently, about casting. Uh, but that uh, that's also part of producing. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, I would say from the three hats that I wear on this film, it was writer, director and then producer. Yeah. Sam is definitely the guy who got the movie made. <laughs> uh, what was the hardest part, in your opinion, working in the context of Catholicism? Was there, did you guys, well, let me, did you guys get any kind of, uh, you know, letters from the Vatican? I'm assuming not, but, you know, any kind of pushback from the Catholic Church, make sure you portray this right, anything in that sorts? Well, the, the, the fact that we had a Catholic advisor was specifically to get everything right, but no, we got no pushback whatsoever. I mean, we actually had the uh, said blessed by a Catholic priest on the first day of production, just to be on the safe side. Uh, and um, the film, you know, here, the thing is, the film is completely respectful of faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to give any spoilers away, yeah, but it it's helped at the end by, you know, mm -hmm. other folks. Uh, but, uh, and, and Diogo Morgado's uh, Monsignor Delgard and, uh, and Bill Sadler's Father Hagen are very sincere in their faith. Um, Bishop Giles, as I said, is more of a politician, but he's not a bad guy. He's just misguided within the context of there's a ghost running around, dude. Um, so there was, we, we got no pushback whatsoever. I mean, we, we tried to do good by right by what we were portraying. I, and you did good. I totally agree with you. I didn't see any disrespect in there. Now you said you were a horror fan. What is your bet? Your favorite subgenre? Is it paranormal? Is it slasher? What would you say is, you enjoy the best? It is not slasher. I like supernatural thrillers. Uh, look, uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to give the boring answer by saying my favorite movie of all time is The Exorcist, because I'm sure so many people say that, but it is. And uh, I love movies like Jacques Tourneur's great film, Curse of the Demon. And um, uh, there's a great Peter Medic movie from 1980 with George C. Scott called The Changeling. But I could, I could go on all night for this. Uh, I like spooky stories with supernatural villains i'm less a fan of, of of the slasher genre i'm the same too the slash the slasher genre had its day back in the late 70s and early 80s i'm totally all into the paranormal because it's the only subgenre of horror that can still scare me because i actually i believe in it and i believe if you believe in something it's going to scare the crap out of you if you see it portrayed on the Absolutely. screen when i was watching the unholy uh the an old movie that definitely came to my mind is the original Amityville house. Yeah. Uh, because of the character aspect, uh, the Amityville house had a lot of scary moments in it, obviously, but it also had great acting with Margot Kidder and it was a very character based and a character driven movie about this family that moved into a haunted house. Uh, so that's the movie that it reminded me of when I was watching uh, sure. The Unholy. Now, uh, going back to the whole horror aspect, uh, did you have any ideas, without giving too much away, in the antagonist of the film, let's call it the antagonist, of sure. going either like, you know, something from hell or something that once walked this earth? Or did you know right away exactly how you wanted it portrayed on screen? It, it, she's from the book. Uh, so the, the, the dark entity, so to speak, is rooted in what James Herbert created and was very much a person who walked the earth and um, was not a very good person mm -mm. And, and was a deceiver. And um, her visualization is brought to life. Um, by two actresses. Uh, the, the body movements, the physical personification is a wonderful Ukrainian actress, a contortionist named Marina Mazeppa. And I urge you to go on YouTube and look up Marina Mazeppa, America's Got Talent, because she was a semifinalist uh, two years ago. And she is freaky. She's this beautiful Ukrainian 23 year old who moves like physically impossible for any other human being. Wow. And the other actress who brings her to life is Lorna Larkin, an Irish actress. And the reason I wanted this character to sound um, not of contemporary United States is because in the reality of her backstory, she would have come from the old country and there's no reason why her accent would have changed. Exactly. And it also gives you a sense of the other that's not part of our community coming in and, and being from another time. And uh, the two of them kind of bring this along with our makeup people and our costume designer kind of created this uh, character. Did you know right away that in the end of the film, when we do see the uh, Mary's face, 
Did you have any kind of internal conflict? Or do I show the audience what this entity looks like? Or do I leave it up to their imagination? Ultimately, we do end up seeing what she looks like. But did that, did you struggle with that in any way? No, I wanted to show what she looked like. Uh, I wanted to create that look because I, I'm a big fan of the Lovecraft idea of open the door a crack, but don't show everything. And uh, But I also uh, think it's a cheat if you can do it properly and don't do it. And if it didn't look effective, we wouldn't have used it. But we think it's creepy as hell, so we wanted to show it. And it, it, she uh, she looks pretty damn creepy. Who did the makeup? Uh, Adrian Moreau, an Oscar-nominated makeup designer. Uh, he was nominated for Barney's version with Paul Giamatti a couple of years ago. And he did he did all the makeup on, on the character, the dark entity. He also did the burn on Fenn's hand, which is kind of subtle, but the, the ghost burns Fenn at some point. Mm -hmm. And so you see. Um, and um, uh, he's, he's a genius. I mean... This thing was a lot of time to put on Marina, and she suffered in good grace, but it, we think it's important for the film. It is. It is. I thought it was great. You know, instead of leaving it up to our imagination with just a mask on, we actually get to see what this... Uh, because what I think it does is we see in the beginning of the film, when it starts off in 1845, of what this person... Yeah, this person was evil, but they were a human being. And they were yes. they suffered a very horrible death. And yes. to see the physical manifestation of that at the end of the movie of what they actually look like, uh, it sort of brought the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie together. And we see how she's killed, and then we see what she looks like. Even as a ghost, we get to see what she looks like. Uh, Evan, this has been a fascinating conversation. The hour has already passed. We probably could go on for another couple of hours. This movie, uh, congratulations again. It's going to be at least in the top five horror movies of 2021, if not the best one. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It is my favorite horror movie of 2021, and it's going to be very hard-pressed in regard to writing, acting, directing for another movie to surpass it. And we have some good ones coming out this year. Yes, we do. We have The Conjuring 3. Uh, there's a lot of good horror movies coming out this year, but I, I want to do a shout out real quick for another one, Malignant, uh, James Wan's movie. Exactly. The, the entity in that one is Marina Mazeppa, our our dark entity. So wow. James Wan, I mean, talk about the uh, someone who has become like the daddy of modern day paranormal movies. And yeah. rightfully so. His movies are great. He is awesome. Thank you so much. Any last thoughts you want to share with the audience? Uh, please go see our movie. We really like it. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked it. I loved it. Please go see The Unholy. It's coming out this Friday to theaters here in the United States, and it's rolling out worldwide. You won't regret it. It's an amazing film. Evan, thank you again so much for being with us. This was an amazing chat. The hour thank just you. flew by. Everybody, on behalf of Evan and myself, stay safe. And until next time, guys, stay walking. Good night. Thank you.